Amen. Well, look like I'm back now. We were having a little problems with um, our laptop. I don't know what the problem is. We got a lot of people out there today, but I'm glad again to be with you. This is Apostle Dr. Sylvester Paul Brinson of the Brinson Institute, and we're coming live to you from our remote location, from our remote location. And so we're going to take some time out and say, come on in, Facebook. Give you some time to come on in, 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 come on in. Thank you, Regina, for picking us back up. Come on in, come on in, come on in, come on in, Facebook. We'll give you some time to come on in. We're so glad. This is our normally hour. Those of you that has been monitoring us from 2 to 3 o'clock every Wednesday with Christ Family Network, and because of the pandemic, the the studios are closed, and we've been doing remote at this point. And uh, but we're just happy what God is doing and what God is doing in the land. I uh, wanted to just uh, uh, talk to you today. I want to talk about, and those of you that saw part of the first five minutes of our other broadcast, I had put the title in there, but we'll put the title in later. We want to talk about chief apostles, the concept of chief apostles, the concept of Apostle Primus into Perez and talk about leadership and the whole concept of the apostolic. And thank you. I thank all of you that have been calling uh, me. I didn't know so many people was watching our program, but I thank God for the variety of people that's watching me all the way, even our sons and daughters in Africa. Those of you that's been watching our program on the Brinson Institute and our teaching, continue to pray for us as we continue to do what God has called us to be in times like these. I um, was going through my books in my library and uh, uh, because I know we're in another time and season, and I ran across one of the oldest books. I remember when the prophetic word came and, and pastoring way back in the 90s, and someone said, Dr. Dr. Brinson, God has called you to be an apostle. And I'm like, what's that? But well, I mean, you know, I was passing on 63rd and King's. What, a, what is an apostle back in those days? Probably in, in 1997 and 91, 92, 93, this whole concept of the apostolic was beginning to open. And uh, 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 Dr. Jonathan David, along with others, wrote a book. And this book is probably, I don't know, you might be able to still get it. Uh, in some place, they say it's out of print, apostolic strategies. Uh, affecting nations. This this copy uh, is a second edition of 1999. It was written in 19, 1997. But let me let me let me read a passage out of Jonathan Davis' book. I want to read something out of this that he wrote in 1997, and I want to see if if, if this checks you, if this really talks to your heart. Because this was way back in 1997 when he first wrote the. In fact, uh, the author wrote, write, wrote his first uh, textbook on the prophetic in 1988 called Blind Eyes. But they developed it on. Listen, listen to what it says. It says, the Lord is raising up such churches. It said, this is the most powerful prophetic time in the destiny of nations. The years ahead of us are years of great significance and are being seasoned with abundant grace for the rising of governing territorial churches. These apostolic ministries and teams will become the stronger men and women of their cities, governing over the spiritual atmospheres and keeping the spiritual climate conducive and correct for ongoing victory for an advancing church. Thy kingdom come. Nobody said the Lord is raising up such churches and ministries across the earth who will be responsible to keep the heavens open for the Lord. This apostolic mandate and authority is being placed upon these ministries. And there's a new breed that will become pillars of the church. God is retraining his leaders to become builders of the spirit realm, making them become relevant in our times and keeping them abreast with what the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth today. What is the Holy Spirit doing in the earth today? I mean, we got to really look at what is happening, what is going on. And so as I begin to thumb through this book 
Yeah, that, that I bought way back. I, I, I just said, wow, this sounds like something is happening in the name right now. Change. Let's look at it. What he says in chapter, he said, most changes are crammed into every day of our lives. Then our great grandmothers, our grandmothers, our grandparents, our, our, our people are even in our, in, our, in our age today. Changes of all kinds. Look at it. Now, he writes this in 1997. Economic, social, cultural, technological, political, religious are happening at an accelerating rate. Changes. In some of these areas, it's just not accelerating. It's exploding. Look at what's happening around us even now. For us to be able to ride these waves of changes, we need to have clear apostolic strategies that will help us have objective action plans to build for the future. What is our objective plans at building for the future? What plans do we have? Now, when we look at the whole situation as we go on today, we talked about it on our last show that God, that Jesus told uh, uh, Apostle John of Isle of Patmos, I want you to put together these letters and send them to the seven churches. Different churches dealing with different issues and different geographical letters, areas. He said, I want you to write because I am he that was, is, and is to come. I want you to write those things that was, those things that is, and those things that is to come. So at this point, as we stand in what is, we must look at and be able to evaluate what was. What was? What was going on before the pandemic? What is going on as a result of what we're going through right now? And then what is to come? Some of our pastors and leaders, you all need to begin to prepare yourself with strategies. When this is over and your city begin to open up and your, your state open up, cash be coming back, people going to be coming back with all kinds of issues, all kinds of circumstances, delayed grief, couldn't bury, bury their loved ones, all kinds of issues are going to be ready. So what are you going to be talking about? Are you ready? Do you have a strategy? Do you have a strategy? Is there a strategy right now? So just like in this, in this text, it said changes of all kinds, changes, economic, social, cultural, technological, Political, religious changes happening at an accelerating rate. Now, because of this pandemic, they're happening at an exploding rate. Exploding, exploding changes. So the question is, for us to be able, can we ride the waves of change? We need to have a clear apostolic strategy that would help us have objective action plans to build for right now in the future. Now, 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 Jonathan David is writing this in 1997. Anything built today must have the view of the future culture and environment for it to remain relevant and useful. Everything that I do and build now, I build it in the looking at the future, what is to come. To build as we built in the past, while the world we are trying to reach is changing drastically, would mean that our religious blindness has put us out of reach with reality. Jonathan David writes this in his book in 1997. We are bound to become victims instead of victors if we stay with the old path. Stay with the old path. The new pioneer leader, Johnson Davis says in his book, the new pioneer leader God is remaking and retraining today, all of us, including myself. I've been in ministry over 50 some years. We, I'm going through a retraining and a remaking, a reevaluation. You must ask yourself as leaders, are you going through, are you being retrained? Are you reevaluating? Or are you stuck? You stuck, you stuck, you stuck. No, 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 no. The leader today, the new kind of leader and our churches must benefit from change instead of fighting change. Change no longer is the ruler of our lives and ministry, but only the rule. Change is not the rule. It's the rule. The rule is, are you changing? Are you constant changing? 
Change no longer is the rule of, of our life and ministry. Instead of resisting changes in our thought, in our thought paradigms, we must welcome and seek harmony with change. How many of us right now have welcomed the change, looking at change and seeking, okay, things are changing. Well, well why are you crying? No, 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 no. What's the strategy now? Because the changes are happening, what are the strategies? How do you harmonize and bring harmony to the melody of change? We, how, how do we do that? How, how have we learned? How are we learning to uh, make changes work for us rather than against us? Uh, like a surfer, you know, surfers, they ride, John and Edward, he said, they ride the waves of change using his powers to take them where they want to go. Now, this was written in this book, Apostolic Strategies Affecting Nations, and I just pulled it out of my library off my shelf that I've had and way back in the 90s. He wrote this book in 1997 about apostolic strategies affecting nations by Jonathan David. Uh, you might be able to get it some places. Uh, some places they have it out of print, but you might want to look at it and look for it. I, I just wanted to bring that out, but I wanted to really begin to talk about some things in the apostolic uh, because I have heard, I have seen, and I have witnessed so much in, in so much concern and confusion about this whole concept of the apostle. But I want to zero in on the whole concept of the chief apostle, uh, Princeton. What about a chief apostle? I mean, you know, we we as a church and a community, we can get so sidetracked off of stuff. I, that's so silly. When it comes down to the church and its leadership, we 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 almost act like the church and its leadership uh, has 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 developed in a vacuum. Has developed in a vacuum of human nature. God has always put people in charge, people at the top, specialists, and those who have moved forward in life, set people. And so it, when it comes down to our spirituality and our religion, uh, we, we want to we dog out and change the pattern and paradigms of our religious structures, our ecclesiastical protocols, as if there are no ecclesiastical protocols, but there are protocols in every other avenue of life. Protocols in every avenue of life. Protocols and you you got the chief this, the chief that, the chief this, the chief of police, the 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 the, 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 the chief firemen, the chief this and the chief that is all built into the structure of, of culture and life in living. And when it comes down to the apostle, well, you know, where the chief apostle come from? Where's that all about? What's that all about? So I want to attempt, I had so much to say today. I don't know where I want to begin. So let me, I want to talk about the apostle. But before I get to talking about the apostle, let me talk about the chief apostle. Let me, let me say something about the chief apostle. Uh, let me just talk about chief for right now. I'm going to go to my scriptures and talk about this whole concept of a chief apostle. You know, I never thought I would have to sit down as an apostle and talk about the concept mm -hmm. of a chief apostle when um, you have a senior pastor. I don't see nobody defending and talking about the senior pastor or the senior elder. Uh, but there is order to every system. Every system has an order. And so for some reason, when it comes down to the system of the gifts of the fivefold ministry, nobody wants order. Even Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 12 and 28. Let me, let me go back and read. Because in every system, no matter how, how the hierarchy is in the system of what God has set the churches in order, he still sets administration. And I guess we just don't understand that. God would not have his church out here just doing things and, and, and going places without any order, without any order. So he gives us the gifts in Ephesians 4. And also and he talks about the gifts in the church. 
But Paul is consistent. So if you study Paul and read Paul, what he talks about in Ephesians, he's mentioned it in Romans, he's mentioning it in First and Second Corinthians. You know, so you got to read him from a holistic standpoint. So in Ephesians, he's talking about the gifts. The gifts. Uh, some he gave some to be, to be it. Not to think about it, not to dream it, not to want it. No, he gave some to be. Be apostle, be prophet, be evangelist, be pastor and teacher, be it. That's a gift to be, to be it, to be it. We need people to be what God has gifted them to be. But then he says structure in there as well. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 12. And I want to go to uh, 12, uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, and uh, no, 1 Corinthians 12. I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12. Now, when he talks about the bits and pieces of the body, Apostle Webster, God bless you, man of God. So many people is on today, but I want to give gratitude to you as my brother out there in Arizona doing a great work. I salute you. Uh, but here it says apostles. So therefore, when he goes down to 1 Corinthians 12 and 20, it says uh, verses 28, it said, And God, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church. Now, this is where... Paul talks about not the gifts now. He's talking about the offices now. God has set in the church. Now he gave, he gave and equipped the saints gifts. He equipped the saints in Ephesians to do the work of the ministry and you know, equip the saints and all of that. But now he says, now, but on this rock, I build my church. I give some water. So I'm so Paul is start, he moves from talking to the church at Ephesus about the gifts. He said, Well, let me, since first Corinthians, they all ain't got no order, they all over the place. Let me let me lay out some order for them. And so God has said some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, gifts of healing. That's different paradigms of healing. Uh, helps governments diversities of tongues. So within the church structure, we've got to have some miracles. Wow, some of us with this pandemic, we need miracles. Where are the miracle workers at? Who specializes in miracles? Miracles, then gifts of healing, different modalities of healing, different types of healings. Helps. Now, in order, if, if God has said that offices, uh, office of helps in the church, plural, that means the church has to have a right to define what it needs and what it call helps. He gives the church the freedom and the capacity for naming. He gives the church the, the, the clarity. God gives clarity in the church to say, look, I'm going to give you a general overview, but be fruitful, multiply, replenish, and have dominion. And in those things, you need to name stuff, organize stuff, structure stuff, put stuff together. I've said it in the church, but if I've said helps in the church, then what kind of helps? Somebody got to give some names to some helps. And I'm saying titles is an overview of a task. And a task, how you do your task based upon your title, is called technology. Thank God for Apostle Bradshaw Webster. You know, that's Bradshaw, title, task, technology. So I don't want no title. Well, no, you don't want to be evaluated. Everything has to have a title. The title is nothing but a summary overview of the task. So if people just went and grabbed the title, that's because they didn't understand the task. The task go with the title. Uh, and then how you do your task because of your title is your technology. People get fired off of jobs because what? Their technology is jacked up based upon the task they was hired for and given a title to. And so now let's look at it. So if there, if there are healings and helps and governments, governments, different types of administrations, we have to identify and set up structures and strategies and protocols for administrations and then diversities of tongues. The capacity to communicate, to communicate, to communicate. We communicate in different modalities. We, so we have the arts. We have the arts. We have the music. We have the tongues. We have social media. So now some of us are stuck on evangelism. So what you going to do now? Well, we got to get out there and knock on doors. So what you going to do now? With social distance, distancing, distancing, 
Some some denominations where they knock on doors and all that stuff. Okay, so now can you? No, no, no. Not only that, but evangelism has to change. We have to constantly change the face of evangelism. While we continue to witness one-on-one, -on -one, we continue to knock on doors, but evangelism, those are doing workshops and seminars on evangelism in your workshops and seminars, you better have seminars and workshops called how to relate to the advancement of technology and social media. There needs to be workshops and seminars on how to access social media and the different types of platforms of social media. Add that to your evangelism workshop and seminars because evangelism is, is a part of varieties of tongues, the capacity to communicate to people. So now I want to throw that out there, but let me go back to the chief apostle. Somebody will press him. Show me in the scripture. Show me in the scripture where it say chief apostle. You know, so many of us, we don't even understand the, the word of God and the word of God. For some, a lot of things that we want the word of God, that we want to bring to the word of God to show us, the word of God was even written for that perspective. But thank God, if you really study it enough and get the revelation, you will find an answer in some kind of way if you become a student to the word of God. So let me try to make some sense out of this. Let me see if I can give you some, some situations that might say something about chief, a chief or what a chief apostle is and what a chief is because in everything that we have, there are hierarchies and hierarchies are ranked according to status or authority. Status or authority. It ain't just authority. And then there are some some situations that's related to that, and as a result of the status and authority, we ought to, there's a certain lifestyle and character that goes with that. So we want to look at that. Let's go then to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5. Paul is writing, and let's see what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm trying to make my platform uh, for the chief apostle. I got a call to some other somebody show me. Jeff, Apostle Branson, show me. I said, well, I'm a governing apostle. Well, uh, now nah, you really going off. All right. So let's look at where, how can we look at chief? What, how does chief, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, and see what Paul has to say in his writings. Um, uh, let's see. Let's look at verse 4. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if we receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another apostle, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul says, for I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. Chapter, you said, show you, the, you, show you chief. So right here, Paul is discussing that uh, within the context of the church, he considered some apostles to be chief. Because if he didn't, he wouldn't have used this verse that says, I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. That's the King James Version. Other version says the most eminent Apostles, oh, now, now I know the most eminent, your grace, your eminent, no, 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 depending on the translation, uh, it'll say the most eminent apostle or the most chiefest apostle. So you asked me, you, you asked me to find in the Bible because you wasn't, you was too lazy to look yourself in the Bible. You was too lazy. A lot of times when people ask you to find stuff in the Bible, don't get mad with them. Understand they're too lazy to study it. The lazy reader wants everybody to read for them. So I'm, you know, I, and so some of you all understand this, but I'm giving this to certain bites and people that are mature. You can take this and teach it and expand upon it more, but I'm just dropping you some sound bites. If there was no concept of a chief apostle, then Paul would not be writing to the Corinthian church saying that uh, he saw himself uh not, not 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 that much behind the very chiefest apostles 
So that means there were chief apostles. There was more than one chief apostle. There were apostles that were considered chief apostles or eminent apostles or leading apostles. So they were known as chief apostles or he didn't see himself as chief tis of the chiefs or chief tis or having some sense of chief. But I wanted to bring this up because somebody called me and somebody texted me and told me find in the Bible where chief apostle is there. So that's one. Now, you can take it from there and argue with yourself, but there's one. Romans chapter 16, verse 7. Let's look at what it says. Romans chapter 16, verse 7. And so here, uh, uh, let's, let's start out with uh, uh, Paul uh, in, in verse 5. It said, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Ephesus who is the first fruit of Arcadia unto Christ. Verse 6, greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Verse 7, salute Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles. Other translations say who are of chief among the apostles, who were in Christ before me. So Paul talks about, depending on the translation you got, that Adronicus and Junior, which was his kinsman, and Junior here being a female apostle, even though scholars say no, Junior was a male, other scholars say no, Junior is a female. I'm not going to argue because God calls all of us and Paul said there's neither male nor female. So you, you go back and you figure that one out. But anyway, I'm trying to make a point. He says that uh, my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, there was a consideration that there were 70 apostles back in those days that were of note, 70 apostles that were chief or eminent in the church. Take that, look at it, go and read it. You asked me to find some information for you. So what I'm doing, technically, I'm just trying to give you some information to show you where we are. I just want to get some information to show you, show you where we are when it comes down to chief apostle or eminent apostles or chief ones. Let's look at first Timothy chapter one, verse 15. I want to go there so that we can also see where we at. First Timothy, first Timothy, uh, chapter one, verse 15. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Chapter one, verse 15. Uh, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, Paul is telling Timothy he was a chief sinner. There's chief, fine chief in the Bible. Well, if he could be a chief sinner, why can't he be a chief minister of the word? Okay, all right, well, Bresson, I don't, I didn't mean, no, 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 no. You asked for me to give you information of chief. So let's stay with that. Now, what we understand is that when we start talking about chief and chiefs, and we're talking about ranking, we're talking about a whole situation of leadership. And I wanted to bring that out because uh, we have different experiences in that. But let me just stay in the New Testament right now because I could go Old Testament because I probably want to say wait to something else that's put it in my spirit at this time. But I want to go to, let's talk about chief then. Let's stay with chief. Let's stay with the chief concept. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Well, I don't know about that Old Testament. Well, let's stay in the New Testament for a minute. Matthew chapter 20. And let's look at verses, um, uh, start at verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him, desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what will thou? She said unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. She wanted them to be promoted. 
But Jesus answered and said, ye know not what ye ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, we are able. And he said unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. They trying to get all up there, trying to be the head poobah. What's going on? But Jesus called unto them and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Now, he did not say that they could not be great. He did not say that. He did not say they could not be chief. He said that if they are, if they are, if, if, if they are, if they will be great among you, let them be your minister. He did not say you cannot be great. He said, let's look at the character. Those who want to be great, those who want to be chief, you chief apostles, you senior pastors, you master prophets, you, you master teachers, nothing wrong with that. He just said that make sure that your personality and your character is that of service. Be a minister. You're submitting yourself to minister. Like Jesus was the chief apostle among his disciples. He got down. He washed their feet. He ministered to them. He was sensitive to their needs. And whosoever, and, and now, okay, well, Brett said, I still ain't seen no chief in the Bible. Oh, oh, well, Matthew chapter 20, verse 27. Let us see what it says. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. He said, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. He didn't say there cannot be any chief among you. Let's get that right now. He didn't say you couldn't be a chief. He was talking to his apostles, right? So if he was a talking to his apostles and discussing chief, well, that says to me that there was some concern about chief apostles and chief among, and they were the apostles. Oh, come on now. See, now y'all want to change it now. Come on, stay with the text. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20, he did not dog out chiefs. He gave a description. He gave a definition. He said, whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister to give his life a ransom for many. So that would give me a definition of a chief apostle. How to relate to a chief apostle. Because a chief apostle is not come to be ministered unto him with flunkies all around them. No, the chief apostle's position and ranking of his authority and grace given to him or her is because they serve, because they are ministers. That's what a chief apostle is. They, they are a servant and they are ministers. So Jesus dialogues with his disciples, understanding that there was a question on the table about some folk wanting to be chief. He didn't say you can't be it. He said, no, there's certain things I don't want you to do like the others do because he said in the world, in the Gentiles, they have chiefs. They have systems of authority and they make you kiss and sniff and do things and maintain your rank. He said, but I don't want y'all, I don't want you treating people like they treat you, like they treat others, but he never discussed or denied the capacity of a group of people having chiefs. Aha. I right, Branson. No, no, no. Come on. Let's stay with the pro. Let's look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 11. 
since you want to find cheats in the Bible and you want to get in discussion about that, you know, 2311. 2311, let's see what it says. It says, um, he says, um, let me see, let's go up here. <coughs> uh, he talks about fair, he's talking to the Pharisees. He says, let's go to verse chapter 23. Let's start from the first verse so we can get the context. Then spake Jesus unto the multitude and to his disciples. St. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That's leadership, judgment. Then you got to go back and understand Moses' seat. Moses' seat. All therefore, whatever... They bid you observe that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. So now the scribes and Pharisees was the leaders of the religious community. So he says now, now, now based upon their position and the, the office, you, you, you got to do what they say do, but, but, but not do they works. Don't, you don't have to do what they do for they say and do not. Now, you know what folks say? Well, you know the brethren ain't right. He always tell people, do what I say, not what I do. So he ain't no good. Do what I say do and not what I do. And then you knock him out. But no, 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 but, but, but wait a minute. Go back for you that make that a name. But you don't have to, not, you have to do what you do. No, no, no. That whole discussion has been on the table. People say, don't do like I do. Do what I say do. They ain't fit. No, no. Well, then you talk back to Jesus in Matthew chapter 23. Verse 3, he said, all therefore, whosoever, whatsoever they bid you observe, because they sit in the seat of the law, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. So Jesus say, do what they say do, but not what they do. For they say and do not. He says, you got leaders who say stuff, preach stuff, and don't do nothing. They don't live right. But they, that doesn't make what they say ineffective. If they're sitting in Moses' seat and they're talking law. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders. That's what they do. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. That's what they do. But that's not what the law say. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make bread their uh, phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garment. They just in there for money. Oh, sound like, you know, so you, hell, you got some apostles and some chief apostles, some senior pastors, and some folks. They do do that. They do that. And love the uppermost rooms at the feast. And the chief seats in the synagogue. There's chief again. If there were chief seats in the synagogue belongs to what? Chiefs. The chiefest among them sit in the chief seats. Uh, you, very seldom do you go somewhere and sit on anybody in a chief seat. So there must have been some chiefest among people. And greetings in the markets. And to be called of men. Rabbi, 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 teacher. But be not ye called rabbi. Now they didn't say reverend here. They said rabbi. Y'all read it right. God said the Bible said don't call nobody no reverend. They didn't say that. He said don't don't. But ye be ye but but be not ye called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. Oh, oh, y'all better read this. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. All right, y'all better read this. Go back and study it. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Here, he still says, but he that's greatest among you shall be your servant. Now, he tells them, don't call nobody master. Don't call nobody father. Don't call nobody rabbi. But he didn't say nothing about don't call nobody chief. Get the text. He said, he that is greatest 
among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. All right. So now, y'all want to, well, does that help you? And go to Mark chapter 10, verse 43, says some of the same stuff I'm talking about now. Jesus talked about that. Uh, Mark chapter 10, 43. Let's look at that. And see where that takes us because that has something to do with Matthew. But I wrote it down in my notes. So I want to be able to read it and talk about it. Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 43. So um, the ambition of James and John. So that was they was talking about that same story. So in Mark chapter 10 is like Matthew chapter 20. But verse 42 says, but Jesus called to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship. Talking about lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. Their great ones. Their great ones now, see. So those who are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise. Lordship and the great ones exercise authority. He said that's what the Gentiles do. He said, but so shall it not be among you. What he's saying is he didn't say they could not be lordship or have authority uh, or not, uh, not, not, they could not rule and be great ones. He's saying how they act, how they carry themselves, what their personality is like, but it shall not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, there's the word chief. Verse 44, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. So that lets me know that Jesus gave room for the disciples to pick the chiefest. Even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom. So here in the text, Jesus did not dog out or make a negative to chief this chief. He only gave a definition of the character of the personality of how those who will be that called that voted that or put that how they're supposed to act and how they're supposed to carry themselves. Does it make sense? All right. That's scripture. Now, you know, y'all can go back and read it yourself, but I don't care how you interpret it. You ain't going to twist it to tell me there's no chief or no chiefess in the Bible. I just wanted to, that was my point, Matthew. So now let's look at Matthew chapter nine. Let's see what that is. Verse 33 and 35, because there, there's the truth. And, the, and he came to Capernaum and being the house, he asked the disciples, what was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? Disciples had a major discussion on their way to Capernaum. And they was talking about that James and John issue, about who's going to be the chiefest. So evidently that was a discussion all the time because the mama tried to pull rank for her sons and wanted to go get their sons to sit on the left and right hand. So I know that started something. You know among preachers how we do. We Come on, Brinson, let that go now. Come on, let it go. No, we ain't going to let that go. Certain things we get to discuss it ain't going to let go. Hey, I thought y'all forgot that. No, I ain't forget. Some people, you can get in a discussion on some stuff and they get bent out of shape and two, three years later, they still ready to discuss that matter. They ain't letting it go. You in the car, y'all went to breakfast or lunch or whatever, had a discussion. You thought it was over. They got on the phone and called you when you got home. So the disciples wasn't letting that go. They, they, that, all, that, all, that, all snap. You gonna get your mama to put, oh, oh, no. But they held their peace, for by the way, they had disputed among themselves who shall be the greatest. So they had disputed, meaning they had a major discussion, argument, dialogue among themselves. The 12 disciples had a discussion among themselves who was going to be the greatest. And he sat down and called the 12 and said unto them, if any man desire to be first, uh, the same shall be last of all. And servant of all. So evidently, somebody was trying to be the first administrative assistant to Jesus. 
you know how, you know, pastors and leaders are. You got people in your church and congregation, they're going to want to be in the inner circle. Well, I'm the first administrative assistant. I'm the best this. I'm, I'm the number one this. So Jesus had 12. He had 70. He had some disciples. You know, but there was a, in his inner core, then sometime he take Peter, James, and John with him some places. And out of the 12, they still was having discussion. Who was going to be first? Is that natural? So now I just want you to see that he did not say for y'all that want to be first. Don't, don't be first. I ain't going to be no first. No, because he say he said some in the church first apostles. Paul says that. So there was nothing, nothing wrong with being first chief or chief des. What he was saying that what goes with that title is because of your task is a technology of how you carry yourself, your attitude, your personality, and your character growth. What it ought be if you're going to be that. I want to be clear on that now. So we have to understand that. So therefore, we're talking about ministry relatedness. Now, let me go to one more. I have a note here, Luke chapter 9, verse 48. Let me see what that is, because I made some notes. You know, I took my time for the lazy people that didn't want to do no study yourself, or some of you all weren't lazy. You just didn't know where to go. You, you didn't even know where to start. Well, Brinson, I, I know that was a discussion, but you know, I didn't even know where to start even looking. Well, guess what? I gave it to you here. Take these. You got these scriptures and read it for yourself. Study it for yourself. Do some research. You don't have to believe me. Don't take my, you don't even have to take my, my commentary on the matter. I gave you the scriptures. Study them. Luke chapter nine, grow up, Google them, study them. It's enough out there, enough information, pro and con, know the issues, the, the, the both sides of the argument. Luke chapter nine, verse 48. Let's see what it says here. And he said to them, said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name, receive it me. And whosoever shall receive me, receive it him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. Now, he that is least. And John answered and said, Hey, master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. And we forbade them because he followed not with us. Oh, oh, you ain't part of us. You can't be a, no. And Jesus said unto him, forbid him not. For he that is not against us is for us. So now you got to take a look at that. Because some folk, you know, people dog out. <laughs> they got the same message. They're not against you. They trying to come with one accord in unity and because they didn't come off, come, grow up on your side of the road, they don't have your color, they don't speak like you and all that, you, they don't rape. Well, I'm apostolic prophetic, so I'm an apostle. Well, how come a Presbyterian can't be an apostle? How come a Lutheran can't be an apostle? How come an independent people can't be an apostle? Oh, 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 all apostles got to come out the apostolic prophetic. Or they got to come out of the Pentecostal to get to the, to the you know, it's got to be under the, the new apostolic movement. And if you're not in the apostolic movement, you cannot be an apostle. Huh? So we got to, but we, huh? Hey, if you don't, if it ain't like me, it don't come out of what I know, it can't be. Well, you know, you know, I'm sure the disciples was like, hey, Jesus, we your disciples, we saw some other folk. Jesus was like, you know, he said in other place, other sheep I have that's not of this fold. Them also I bring. He's a shepherd. You're not the only one. Your church, your denomination, your persuasion, it ain't the only one. Come on now. So let's look at it. I say. So my, 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 my statement on this is there has to be. There has to be. I think the whole concept of chief, chief dis, great first has to do with responsibility, has to do with relationships, has to deal with approachableness, has to deal with an attitude of empathy. Because you got people, you know, they get their little positions. As you say, they get the big head. 
No, 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 no. Jesus said, no, no, no. Those who are the greatest among you, they ought to be the most reachable. We got people now. You know, they apostles. We got folks who ain't even apostles. You can't get them. They never answer their phone. You call them. You can't reach them. You go to church. They got all security all around them. I guess because they got a lot of crazy folk there. I don't know. 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 Well, I do know, but I'm, I'm not going to discuss that. I'm going to leave that up to you. I don't have to take everything in this show. I'm looking at a lot of people who's been around. You all are smart. I'm giving you some sound bites, hopefully, that you can take. You can preach on it. You can teach on it. You don't need to tell people you got it from me. Just get it. I give it to you. So we must look at that. Now, let's look at authority. People don't want to be an authority. That's the big issue. It's about, a, it really, you know what? It is about authority. Let's look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 9. Why we got to have a chief? Well, I mean, why are you asking? Do you want to submit to authority? Matthew chapter 8, verse 9. Uh, this, is, this, this story is about the centurion that sent for Jesus to come heal his son that was sick of the palsy. And Jesus said, okay, I'm going to come and heal him. And so the centurion answered in, in, in Matthew chapter 8, uh, and then also in Luke 1 says, the centurion sent a person to say, don't come. Here it said, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should have come up under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth it, and to another come, and he cometh it, and to my servant do this, and he do it. Because I am a man under authority. Matthew 8 and 9. I, I am a man under authority. So here's a man under authority. He's under authority with authority. He submitted to protocols and have a protocol. <clears throat> Some of us, we got a protocol, but we don't submit to nobody else's protocol. Now that's that's bad. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad. Your protocol ought to be directly related to a protocol. So in a system of protocols, there should be somebody else that you submit to. Come on now. <laughs> Submit to, even if, well, they can't be higher than me. Well, then come on, they should be related. They should be related. The, you know, I, was, I got another book in my library I was reading about the mentor grid. The mentor grid, a person that mentors you, if you want to do that, just kind of think in your mind across, down and across, and you are in the middle of that cross. So you sit in the middle of the cross. They said in a mentor cross relationship, the top of the cross, you remember you're in the middle. The top of the cross ought to be somebody 10 years older than you. Been there, done that, got a t-shirt. You're in the middle. The bottom of the cross ought to be somebody 10 years younger than you because the person younger than you is going to hold you accountable. The person younger than you is going to say, why? Explain to me why. And you got to be able to articulate your positions, why, to the person under you and then you got to learn how to submit to somebody over you that when they talk and share and dialogue with you, you can say, okay, I understand that. But that person over you has to help you to understand. So that's the down line. That's the down line across. You're in the middle. In the middle of the stick is you. Ten years older than you, ten years younger than you. Now the other side of the cross, on one side of the end of the cross, is somebody your same age and gender. Your same age and gender. Because at a certain age and your gender, there's certain things you go to. A woman, you can say, child, I'm 25. I'll always be 25. When you get to 40, 50, 50, 60, 50, 50, 40, 50, start PMS in 56, you better have some other sister to talk to. And brothers, when you go get to that, you know, that age where you know you acting crazy, you, you know certain ages, you got to be able to identify in your age and your gender so you can see how you fit in the universe of humanity. And you have to have people that can talk to you at your level and your age and your gender to make sense out of life. 
So on the other side of that cross, you must have and relate to people in your own vocation to hold you accountable. Doctors talk to doctors. Lawyers, if you're a doctor, you just don't come. Well, I got a cure for cancer. No, you're going to write your paper. You're going to come before other doctors, and they're going to approve your stuff and agree with you and try your stuff. So you need, in that whole concept of relationships or mentoring, remember the top of the cross, somebody 10 years older than you that has a experience more than you. Because there's some people 10 years older, they don't have no experience. You know, somebody in experience. And then there's somebody 10 years younger than you, you in the middle. Then on this side, somebody your same age and gender that can talk about life and its experiences as you go through at your age. And then on this side, somebody in your same vocation that can talk about the varieties and hold you accountable. That's called the mentoring grid. So we've got to have people that touch our lives. So you got to be able to understand there's a relationship of being under authority and over authority. If you're not under authority, you jack up your over authority. Jesus says, if you're going to be first among them, you have to be the greatest. All right. Well, just do because I say do. No, no, no. So the man of God says, I mean, the centurion say, I understand authority. I understand principalities. I understand powers and rulers, and I understand authority. I understand power. I understand power. People that understand power and authority, why are you going to be, I think it was Apostle, my good sister, Prophet Loretta Pickett, said, Brinson, we got a lot of people who don't want to submit to the natural laws, but want to jump into the spiritual laws, when the biblical text said first natural, then spiritual. So you don't want to be subject to the natural laws of power, but you want to walk in the spiritual laws of power because the spiritual laws of power has something to do with the natural laws. All right, I know, I know, I know. I know, I know that there's been some information that's frustrating, but let's look at humans. So we're talking about authority. We're talking about in life, God has set up human authority. And governments. Okay, let's go to Romans chapter 13, verse 1. I'm giving you all scriptures. I hope that some of the preachers and others that's listening to me can take this and you all take it and, 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 and do what you got to do. You know, I was, you know, some of you pastors, you couldn't even submit to the government, say, stay home. Close your church. I mean, come on now. I mean, it ain't going to hurt. I mean, people, you know, please. I, we, I ain't even go there. I ain't going to go over there. Uh, let's look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Says Paul writes, he said, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. There is no power but of God. So any power that exists comes out of God. Well, Brent said, I, I don't, hey, 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 hey. The text says, there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. It says speeding is 35 miles an hour. Go 50. The damnation, you're going to get a ticket. If not get into accident. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? What you afraid of the power for if you ain't doing nothing? Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth you, he bared not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Don't be subject and get an attitude about it. Be subject because in your mind you thought it through. For conscience sake, you're going to be subject to the law of the land. For for this cause, 
Paul says, for this cause, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers. They're God's ministers. What? You mean the president, the politicians, the leaders, the voted people, the, uh, the governor, the mayor, the supervisor on your job? Uh, uh, what? They are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all dues tribute. Jesus said, render to Caesar the things of the Caesar and God the things of the God. That's what Jesus said. Now Paul comes along in Romans chapter 13 and says in verse 7, render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due custom to whom custom fear to whom fear honor to whom honor. So if I'm over into a domination and I come into a church and in that church they have a bishop and the protocols of that bishop is when we get up, we honor him and say, Bishop, your grace, then that's his honor. That's his protocols, his protocols, your eminency. That ain't what that, well, that, oh, that's all that stuff. Uh, but that's his stuff. That's her stuff. You in their house. And everybody else in the house respects. So who are you? I'm God's man, God's woman. Oh, shut up. Honor them. Whatever their protocols is, respect it. What do it got to do with you? So it don't give me no problem to come and say, Bishop, your grace. Chief apostle, giving honor to the chief apostle, to the pastor, to the elders, to the deacons. God bless you. I bless you with the name of the Lord. Why can't you say that? If that's the protocols of that church, then, hey, do the protocol. If eat meat offend your brother, don't eat the meat. I mean, come on now. Paul is talking about that. He said, render, therefore, to all dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Then he goes on. That's in the biblical text. Y'all still fussing about the chief apostles. We're talking about authority. We have so many stubborn, knucklehead people <laughs> with your stubborn self. It says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity. Iniquity is in the bloodline. Some of y'all just stubborn because your mama was stubborn. Your daddy was stubborn. Your, it runs in your bloodline. You stubborn. And you were probably born stubborn. You stubborn. Because stubborn, it, said, it says to be stubborn is like iniquity. To rebel is like the sin of witchcraft. Why can't you just obey? How come we can't just honor people? Well, Brinson, how come we just can't get all get along? Because you don't want to respect the protocols of the government, God order, structure, authority, human authority. So we got human authority. We have family authority, governmental authority. We have church authority. In all the various scriptures, uh, we have business protocols of authority. You all forget about that. What about all of those authorities? Human authority. Let's look at what I wrote some things down here. Uh, so we have authority in business. There's certain authority in government and church. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16. I put it in my notes. I wonder... <clears throat> it must have meant something when I wrote it in the notes the other day when I was just really doing Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 11 to 16. Let's see what it said. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man unto the measure of the statute of the faithfulness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things which is the head, even Christ for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, 
according to the effectual working in the measure. Effectible, the effective working in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That's a protocol structure of authority for the body of Christ. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Uh, let's see what that says in my notes. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. I hope this is helping some people. I hope that all this research I did, that some of my leaders and others that's watching, I hope that you take this information I gave you, rework it through your process, re run it down to your paradigms, put it in your notes and explain it to your people and put it as a part of your agenda, how it best it fits you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Let's see what it says. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. You don't want nobody that's supposed to be taking care of you or, or supervise you, have a bad report. Well, how is Brinson? Well, you know, you know, he got an attitude. He he don't want to. He I, I tell him to be here at two o'clock. He always come at two thirty. I tell him to be on time at never on time. I, I ask him, you know, before he leave, uh, if he would go by and check on so-and-so. And every time I ask him to do something, he always forget. You know, they saw that in mental health. They call that passive aggression. You really don't want to do it. But you do it because, you know, you don't want to have no problem. But we got to keep reminding you to do it. And you do it attitude. And then sometimes you forget to do it because it's passive. Grab you obey me, but you obey me. But you, you say you love me, but you keep not my. No, no, no. Some people are responsible for your well-being and must give an account to others and God for what you are. Especially those, those of you that have a spiritual leader. God put you at a church in the ministry. They're your spiritual leader. They must give an account. God holds them accountable to you. And he owes you accountable to them. And so when he gives, says, well, tell me about Sister Coco, they should be saying, oh, thank God. God, I'm glad you sent Sister Coco. She's just a blessing to the ministry, a blessing to the church, rather than saying, well, God, you know, you need to do something with Sister Coco because I don't can't do nothing with her. I don't even know why you sent her over here. Why don't you send her somewhere else? <laughs> I told, you know what I told some of my pastors? You know, we oversee of over 100 churches and ministries and pastors and sub lines. We have chief apostles who have churches under them and churches under them. So if I add up all of them, that comes out to a group. I told them, you know what? Some of y'all, people get mad at you and they leave. Some leave and don't even tell you they go. Some will write a letter. Some, I said, you know what you should do? Some of y'all should go through your membership and write a letter. And, and seal the letter. And that church, and stand at the back of the church and get them letters out. Say, open it when you get home. Say, dear Sister Coco, this is a, to notify you, you're no longer part of this ministry. I release you. Because if they get mad, they're going to release you anyway. So, you know, a little leaven, leaven, not the lot. So some of y'all need to feel free to release certain people, let them go. You know, they God's people anyway. You know, you trying to go, they got all hell in your church and all going through all kinds of stuff. You trying to put up with them. They don't obey. Let them go. So you could have peace. He called us to peace. Okay. First Peter chapter five. Let me see what I put down there for. We all this come out of chief apostles. And I, you know, I didn't get to my other thing. So maybe part two, I'll probably do that. But first Peter chapter five, uh, verses one through 11. 1 through 11, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Look at it. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight, therefore, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, trying to make some money, but a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that faded not the way. You may be a chief shepherd, but there's a chief over you. You a man under, or under authority and over authority. So you have authority as a chief, apostle, a chief, this, a senior pastor. But there's also somebody have authority over you. Likewise, ye younger 
submit yourself unto the elder. Nah. Millennials. Nah. Y'all hear what I say? Huh? Y'all hearing what I say? Submit yourselves. It says you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. How come we just can't be subject to one another? Give each other some room. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. God resists the proud. Give grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cared for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. I'm telling the, you know, I'm going to pray that the devil get away from me. No. The Peter said, resist the devil. Jesus said, resist him here, flee. Don't go praying. I pray on that devil. I beat the, no, just resist. Resist steadfast in the faith. Resist while you steadfast in what you believe. Knowing that some afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Some, some of us going to be afflicted. That's the devil. Okay, yeah, it may be the devil. Yeah, and it might be an affliction. But some going to, it's going, that's part of certain people suffering in ministries. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto this eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, mature you establish you, strengthen you, settle you. Huh? Look at what we're supposed to do as leaders. What as the body of Christ in general. So if the if those who achieve, they have a great responsibility. But look, the God, the Jesus Christ that he has suffered, that you have to suffer a while, make you perfect, one, establish two, strengthen three, settle you, four. Some folk ain't settled, they run all over the place. They can't know the system. Go somewhere and sit down and learn again some study. Go get mentored. You ain't settled. You start here and you start over here and the Lord told you here and then over here and then over here. A vagabond. Just a vagabond. Just a vagabond Christian. Just a, 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 a what, what? No, no, don't want to be fathered by nobody. No mothered by nobody. Huh? Just a, a bastard. A spiritual bastard. No daddy. No mama in the ministry. Just all over. The Lord just talks to you. Go sit down. Be settled. And to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So I got those scriptures. I need you to look at those scriptures because when we talk about the chief apostle and other things, we're really talking about how God wants us to be, how we're supposed to do. So I know I've been gone a long time. I've probably gone past my hour, but I wanted to finish this. Uh, so those of you that um, will, if you're watching this show uh, by Christ Family Network. I get an hour on that. I went over a little bit. So you might want to pick me up by going to my uh, YouTube and go to YouTube, www.youtube.com. Go into the search bar and type in Dr. Sylvester Paul Brinson III. And you can pick up this teaching on my YouTube account and then subscribe. Amen. We have about 90 teachings on that already, uh, 90 different teachings on a variety of things. So if you, uh, our hour is probably far spent, but we continued in this show because we got tied up and had to switch over. But uh, you can pick up this entire teaching of, on YouTube. Amen. So we thank God for you. Those of you that, uh, uh, that, that there are some people that said, Brinson, we want to bless you with Cash App. So if you got Cash App, you know, it's a dollar sign, Tabernacle 7, hashtag uh, dollar sign, Tabernacle 7. You can send a donation to Tabernacle 7, or you can go on our website, www.thebrinsoninstitute.com, thebrinsoninstitute.com, and go on that uh, website and hit our donation page and uh, go to PayPal. Some of you all, our telephone number is on the screen. Uh, you can go to that for Zelle. You can connect us by Zelle to our telephone number. Hope I reach ministries. Hope I reach ministries international. We thank God for you. 
Until next time, I want you and pray for you that you'll be blessed. I hope this teaching on the apostle, the chief apostles, leadership. Remember, you say chief apostle. Don't get upset about that. You say senior pastor. Uh, you call yourself master teachers. And we didn't even get a chance to go to the Old Testament. David talked about the master musician to the chief musicians. So when you talk about chiefs, it has something to do with authority, influence. Uh, some of you all will talk about that later. John Tessol in his book talks about that. So when we talk about chief, we're talking about God putting a mantle on certain people. And that mantle is a certain cloak, a certain cloak of God's presence, God's anointing, God's authority, God's influence, God's favor, and opportunities that come into your life. Huh? Let me say that again. See, you know, there are certain levels of maturity in the development of an apostolic anointing, certain levels of maturity in an apostolic anointing that God puts a certain mantle, a certain cloak, a certain coat of God's presence, anointing, authority, influence, favor, and opportunities that come on your life. I'm going to talk about that later, but those of you that need to get the book, John, Dr. Apostle, Dr. John Tesola, T-E-T-S-O-L-A, a good friend of mine. He wrote a book way back in 2002 called The Apostolic Culture and Pattern, Understanding the Apostolic Ministries, Its Anointings, and Its Applications. And I just read that statement from his book, Apostolic Culture. You need to get it. Google him. Get this book. If you're an apostle or you're in the apostolic, you want to know about it, then start reading. John Tessola, uh, book, books out. He's good. John Eckhart, Paula, Paula, Paula Price. There are different people that have books out on the apostolic. Go study it. Be familiar with it. Just don't be running your mouth all over the place. There's too much information out here. Too many books, too many teachings, too many, too many people that God has anointed and gifted. And so we want to make sure that you keep that in your mind and keep that in your spirit. And until next time, go with God and be thou anointed.